Hey, y'all. Welcome. Welcome back. Oh, my gosh. I'm here with Landon. Hello. Say Happy New Year 2024, Landon. How's it happy going? New Year. Uh, new Year, new hair. We're we're enjoying we're enjoying 2024. I uh, started the new year uh, sick as a dog. So woohoo! <laughs> Glad yeah. to be helping. <laughs> yeah. Hi Jane. Hi Rar. Oh my gosh, y'all were supposed to get Landon last week, but unfortunately, um, you know that all got delayed because uh, because she has to be a teacher, and so you know as you know teachers are sick all the time. Um, yes. poor thing. Landon, do you want to, do you want to tell them you, you basically, you had your own bout of, um, of supernatural, like oh, sick yeah. vampirism sort of thing. It was <laughs> so fun of two weeks of just like getting sick and then getting better and then getting sick again. Yeah. Uh, my, we're, we're truly, my school is currently playing what feels like sickness bingo, uh, where it's things like, you know, it's like, oh, who's got COVID? Who has ne walking pneumonia? Who has bronchitis? It's all of the, the fun adventures that are happening. So unfortunately it was my turn, uh, to get bingo. And that's what ended up happening. My least favorite game of bingo. <laughs> Woohoo. <laughs> I didn't I win any. Back. I didn't win oh. any bingos over the holiday. We there was bingo on the Thank cruise, God. but I didn't I didn't win any. So as far as bingos go, we only land in one, and she got the worst kind. So you know, worst kind. <laughs> uh, but we're yeah. back, baby, and we're ready to. T and I am pale as a ghost right now. I don't. The lighting is just making me look like I belong on Twilight. Yeah, you know, I did my highlight this morning and I, to get on here, like you see, and to I was almost little... like, I was like, should I whole face highlight? Should I whole face should... highlight for this? I thought about it really hard, you guys, but I just thought that the camera would probably not like it. So I just went with some extra highlight and, and glitter. So hopefully I'm glittery enough for our topic, which is, oh my God, what is it, Landon? Twilight! We are starting off our media dives on um, this this saga of a generation. Um, Twilight. Since we talked yes. about Harry Potter, uh-oh. I spilled my <laughs> drink all over up. myself. <laughs> Hole in my lip. <laughs> That's how we gotta do it. Yeah, uh, so since Twilight. We, yeah, since we talked about Harry Potter and we've done the deep dive on Hunger Games that we did last year, we thought, well, might as well get this one out of the way. Uh, and we're going to talk about our relationship with with Twilight a little bit later. But it is, I think, um, fairly new. Like, we both consumed them. But it is it is fairly new to you, Karen. Like, mm -hmm. other, like a, you were not in the fandom. No, we'll talk about that. But no. So we've got kind of two perspectives here. Landon did have a twi hard phase. I had a I'm not like other girls. This crap is garbage. I don't know why y'all like it phase. So yep. um, so yeah, we'll go into some more detail on that. But let me show y'all this be absolutely freaking beautiful PowerPoint that Landon made for us. Uh, here we go. Twilight, the love story of a generation is so beautiful. It's so, so beautiful. Yeah. I do I do truly love that Google Docs just has the Twilight font. As I know, right? Every, every day font. You didn't have to go download it or anything. No, it just happened. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about it the way that we talk about all of our first media dives. And that is Karen, what's your favorite thing about this thing this series? Or okay. the, the first book, I should say. Yeah, that. okay, so this is really just the first book. Like, of course, spoilers ahead. As you guys know, this is not a spoiler-free podcast, and we will be mentioning things um, from future books and movies and stuff like that, I'm sure. So if you've not experienced Twilight and you want to, which that has to be like maybe five people on the whole planet, then turn off now. But if you either have already experienced Twilight or you don't care, I'll tell you my favorite thing from this first book. My favorite thing from the first Twilight book was the kidnapping action sequence. Oh my God, you guys. So, and I, I'll tell you the part that I really, really enjoy. The part I really enjoy is honestly where they're going through the airport and Bella's trying to figure out how to outsmart smart um Alice and Jasper and how to get away from them because it's the moment in the book where you kind of figure out that like Bella is somebody that actually does have some intelligence and she does have some um kind of like uh 
uh, drive, it, you know, to meet her goals. Whereas all the way up until that point, the excuse we've been given for why she doesn't have to try hard in school is because she's basically repeating a year. Like it's trying to compare Forks to Phoenix, right? And it's saying like, oh, we already learned all this stuff in my school in Phoenix. So I'm basically repeating. So it's really the school in Forks is like, it's eh, it's whatever. Like it's, it's, I already know all this stuff, right? So up until this point in the book, you have no reason to think that Bella is necessarily smart in any way whatsoever until you get to this sequence. And honestly, like I was gripped. I was like, oh my God, how the fuck is she going to get away? Because y'all, I didn't remember. I did not remember how this went. (laughs) So I was actually interested in that particular scene. And I I had totally forgotten how it ended, you know, how she gets there. And it's like, it's all a trick. Her mother wasn't kidnapped in the first place. And I was like, oh, really? I didn't know. I mean, I really didn't remember. So it was actually very interesting and surprising for me. And I wish, it made me wish there had been more mystery and intrigue in the rest of the book because it was actually kind of enjoyable, those chapters. So that's my favorite thing in the first Twilight book. Yeah, I think, I think that, uh, Stephanie Maya really had to use her brain power mm. on that. Like mm. she really had to like be like, okay, I have written myself into a corner of letting Bella go with the psychic. And how am I going to outsmart the psychic? And she does it. She truly, she truly makes one that makes sense. Yeah. And is meaningful and is really well done. Uh, and I think it is the one aspect in which Bella has a personality. Yeah. Pretty in this, much. In this, in this scene right here. Uh, this is it. But it's a, it's a good part. I think it's uh, very dramatic. Yeah, it's incredibly is... dramatic. And it's melodramatic in a way that that I like, which we'll talk more about um, on the next mm-hmm. slide. Um, so yeah, I actually, this is like, genuinely those couple of chapters, I was like, oh, these are pretty good. I actually am enjoying myself here, you know? Um, so yeah, favorite thing. That's mine. Landon, what is your favorite thing from the first Twilight book? Well... I mean, who doesn't love a short queen with a bunch haircut? Uh, I here's the deal with Alice. I did not hold as much appreciation for her in my younger years as I did in this reread. I think that that she is very quirky, and she she just always seemed like the like I'm like the annoying one in in it. I was like, I don't really care about Alice. But in this one, she's very quirky. I think that she does have like a lot of good insight. I think that it shows that if there are some things that she says that if Stephanie Meyer wanted to write like something a little bit heavier and deeper, she could. And I think Alice is like the way in there. Um, And also just love her. Just love a little sunshine girly who doesn't remember her past (laughs) i mean alice is kind of like this book's version of a manic pixie dream girl yes and i and i do think that like that trope has been done to death to where there are some terrible examples of manic pixie dream girls in media if you look at the past couple of decades but alice is not one of those examples she's actually a pretty relatable and interesting character as far as like that manic pixie dream girl type that uh that we have that uh, that got so popular you know in the first decade of the 2000s. Yeah, I think she also, uh, <laughs> just knowing Stephanie Meyer's back story and her, where she came from, I can't ever imagine Stephanie Meyer writing a manic dr- pixie dream girl because, you know, that right. would be against a lot of her belief. Yeah. Uh, but Alice is pretty much aligned with what would be within her belief. So that makes mm-hmm. sense. Yeah, and that's probably why she's actually an enjoyable manic pixie dream girl, because she is toned down from the typical yeah. trope of that character. Well, and is also written through written through a female perspective. I think that right. that's the biggest thing with the manic pixie dream girls is when they're written through a male male gaze, they come right. out completely different. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We alluded to it, but or let's talk about the summary. Let's talk about what happened in Twilight. It might have been 12 years since you last picked up the book. You might have missed the whole phase. Who knows? But let's talk about what this book is actually about. Yeah. So if you if you don't remember, here's your time. Here's your time. 
We have 17-year-old Bella Swan, who is moving from Phoenix, Arizona to Forks, Washington, to live with her father, Charlie, because she wants to give her mother, Renee, some time with her new boyfriend, Phil, as he plays minor league baseball across the country. Uh, She hates Forks, Washington, and hasn't been there in years, has a distant and cold relationship with her father for no apparent reason at all. Um, But she is the self-sacrificing kind of girl who's willing to let her flighty mother uh, go. And so therefore we end up at Forks High School where uh, Bella becomes very popular since they're not used to new kids. Um, And In her awareness of the new people she is meeting, she notices five strikingly beautiful students that all seem to sit together at lunch while not eating anything. We have Edward and Emmett and Alice Cullen, along with Rosalie and Jasper Hall. Uh, She learns that they are the adopted children of Dr. Carlisle and Esme Cullen, some outsiders who had moved here a few years ago. Uh, Later, Bella sits next to Edward in biology class, completely taken by his looks, but he is less than friendly and his hostile nature towards her automatically makes her uh, 10 times more attracted to him. After disappearing for a week, Edward returns to school and seems whiplashly like kinder and friendlier to her. Bella starts to notice some odd things such as his cold skin and color changing eyes and when Edward is, and when Edward saves Bella from being crushed by a van, he gaslights her to thinking that she's going crazy. He didn't move that fast at all. He was standing right next to her, in fact. Naturally, that night, Bella dreams of Edward watching her. Uh, Edward overhears, later that week, Edward overhears Bella saying that she's planning on visiting Seattle, and he offers to drive her down, and then at the same time informs her that they should not be friends. A weekend, at the weekend beach party, Bella meets Jacob Black, who's a local native teen, who tells her the Quaalude legend that says the Cullens are actually vampires, albeit ones that hunt animals rather than people. And while Jacob admits that he doesn't believe the story, his family and his tribe does. Later, Bella and her friends drive to Port Angel- Angels a, t- to shop, and Bella wanders off by herself. Just four men begin to harass her. Edward roars up in his car and rescues her. He admits that he can read everyone's mind except for hers and says that he knew what those men were planning. On the way home, uh, Bella admits that sh- that Edward, um, that she, uh, to Edward, that she knows that the Cullens are vampires. Uh, Edward is surprised, but gives her all the details of what it is like to be a vampire, that they don't have to sleep in coffins and that they can sustain off of animal blood. Uh, And upon having this true, honest conversation, Bella decides that she's actually in love with Edward. They grow closer despite his family not liking the concept of them being in a relationship. And on a date, he shows her his sparkly skin while he confesses that he was tempted to bite and drink all of her blood when they first met. Uh, he shows shares the story of, her, of how he was born, that he was born in Chicago in 1901 and was dying of influenza when Carlisle saved him by turning him into a vampire. Uh, Edward then admits that he spies on Bella almost every single night and he hears her talking about him in his sleep. Uh, he reveals that this is the first time in his very long life that he has been in love. Of course, the next day, Edward brings Bella to meet his family, and Alice, who can see the future, has a, has a vision of a storm coming. So they decide to play baseball, the all-American sport. Uh, during the game, three other vampires approach the Cullens, and a breeze ruffles Bella's hair and, reviews, and reveals her human scent to the leader, James. In order to run away, uh, Bella pretends that she is broken up with Edward to her father, Charlie, and tells him that he is, she is moving back to Phoenix. Uh, Alice, Jasper, and Bella drive south to Phoenix uh, with Bella. Edward, Carlisle, and Emmett plan to draw James in the opposite direction. Uh, But as they're in the hotel room, um, Alice has a vision. Bella identifies it it as one of her former dance studio. uh, And one has a room in her mother's house. Edward informs Bella that James has alluded to them, has alluded them and gotten on a plane to go somewhere. And he tells her that 
he, Carlisle, and Emmett are going to fly to Phoenix to protect her. Uh, the next morning, the phone rings. Bella answers it. Here's her mother's voice saying his name, and James' voice cuts in. Tells Bella that he has Renee and that she must slip away. So as they're on their way to the airport, Bella sneaks away. Once they're at the mother's house, Bella gets a phone call, tells her that they're at their from James telling him to arrive at the dance studio upon the studio discovers that it was all just a, a ruse that Renee was never really in danger that James had used an old film to track Bella into it and that he now had her in his clutches so he attacks her she passes out regains consciousness uh, and hears Edward calling her name uh, Carlisle tends to her injuries and discovers that James had bitten her. And the only way to free it is if Edward sucks the venom from Bella's blood. Uh, Edward is afraid to do this because Bella's taste to him is undeniable and he will not be able to stop himself. Uh, <laughs> however, he finds the strength to do so. Days later, <clears throat> Bella wakes up in the hospital room. Uh, Emmett and Jasper have killed James. Uh, and he had been able to stop drinking his blood. And that was proof that the two of them were meant to be together. Uh, in order to explain injuries to the parents, Edward and Alice do a whole bunch of funny things, which Karen hasn't been able to see yet because Midnight Sun is a wild ride. No, uh, but in this book, we do get like a sentence a explanation where Edward does say, Alice did some funny stuff. Yes, uh, including falling down some stairs and breaking a window. Uh, Edward ends up taking Bella to prom, uh, saying that he doesn't want him to miss out on any human experiences. Bella is disappointed that Edward won't change her into a vampire forever, having, of course, known this man for three months at this point. Uh, but he promises her he'll stay with her, and she decides that that's good enough for now. And as they dance, Edward smiles and leans down to kiss Bella's throat. Wow. Whoa. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> love, what a ride. Let me tell you, love, that's what true love is made out of there, folks. <laughs> Jesus. Yes. Oh my God. Um. Yeah, all of that stuff happens in Twilight. If you don't remember, the movie is fairly accurate. I did rewatch yeah. the movie as well. And it's basically the same plot summary. Um, just with some added little quirks from the actors. That's really the only difference. Um, so yeah, you can do that much faster than uh, than reading through the book. <laughs> yes. Well, and then and, and frankly, that was about as much detail as you need to know about the Twilights in order to talk about it at any given time. Because man, oh man, the <sighs> it's so fascinating. Like having read it and being like, she tried to drag this out. She truly did try to make this not a weak love story like that happened over the course of a week or two, because every single time it felt like a few days later and a month passed. And it was just like, oh, man, Stephanie, you're trying so hard. Uh, but there is a lot happening. of time skips. There is a lot of time skips in this book for for a romance. You know, um, there's just a lot of times where like. Edward is off doing Edward things. And so Bella just skips ahead to the next time Edward shows up. <laughs> because I think that that's, and we're going to have a whole conversation, but I think that that's truly like part of this is that mm -hmm. there is no con, there is no story outside of the love story. Right. So let's talk about our experiences with this, because I think that that's really going to put into light our perspectives and our point of view. Uh, yeah. Karen, you've already kind of talked about it a little bit, but do you want to talk about, the twilight revolution that was happening and where you were and what you stood for during it. Yes. Okay. So when Twilight came out, I was in the process of graduating college and starting my career. It was a very tumultuous time. This was during the uh, the 2008 housing crisis, basically. Not exactly then, but like around those couple of years when the first couple of books were coming out and it was getting popular and that sort of thing. And um, so... Uh, as you might remember, the first book really didn't hit it off with everybody. It wasn't until like the next book came out that the fandom kind of took off. And so at that point, you know, I was super into Hunger Games and I was like, this seems to be the other popular thing. Let me give it a try. And I was like, I don't get it. This is trash. <laughs> and I threw it away metaphorically and probably physically too. And so... 
basically my experience of reading the book was kind of like, I don't know why this is popular. At that point in time, I was just past, like from my age, I was just past that like falling in love for the first time age. And basically what that meant for me is reading this book was very uncomfortable because it reminded me of the the things that I was not happy with about about like my high school and and just before high school experience of being so super boy crazy, right? So on top of just it not being very good, for me, it was about experiences that I just really was not interested in revisiting at that time. So I was very like, not like other girls. I don't know why people like this. This is garbage. I refuse to understand their experience. <laughs> and I know, though, upon now rereading it as an adult, if I had been five, six, seven years younger, I would have read this and been a twihard. I would have been right there with y'all that were into it. But it hit at the time that was exactly the wrong time for me. And so I could not find anything enjoyable about the book uh, upon first read and was actively annoyed that it was a large fandom that I could not escape on the internet when all I wanted to do was experience Hunger Games and Harry Potter fandom at that time. So that was my experience when Twilight first came out. I love but that. Uh, you had a very different experience, right, Landon? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I feel like I just need to like set the scene. Imagine yourself, freshman year. You have just discovered what fan fiction is. You have just learned about fandom itself. You have been given un like unrestricted, as far as you're aware, access to the internet and then to all the fandom forums. And you're discovering Harry Potter romances and all these things that got you excited about the Harry Potter books and all these all these romance sort of things that that weren't really the main focus were existing on fandom. And then you went for Christmas break and you open up a trilogy box set of twilight new moon and eclipse and you've never heard of the series at all and so you're like hey vampires romance i'll try it so you pick up the book and you read the entire series in 48 hours <laughs> including literally li it's so funny that you're like i literally threw the book out including literally throwing new moon across the room so hard that the spine snaps uh <laughs> it had me from go i it was the right time the right moment the right move all of it collided into this colossal moment and then i went back to school and i realized that the girl i had a crush on also liked twilight and dun, dun, dun. the rest was history <laughs> i started writing that was my first role play i started writing role play for the first time because literally a friend and i would take a notebook and go back and forth with Edward and Bella roleplay on, like, like they used to do in the old cons. Like, back and forth on a notebook. And tell tell everybody, were you Edward or were you Bella? Oh, I was Bella. Of course yeah. I was fucking Bella. Yeah. Why wouldn't I be Bella? You yeah. wanted to be Bella because Edward, because, like, Bella didn't matter. Edward mattered. Uh Oh, the boy I had, everyone was connected to Edward. Oh, it was so ridiculous. And it blew up and it became my life for about seven to eight months. And then I got better taste. <laughs> but <laughs> I was all in and I was, I was team Edward and I was here for the movies and I was at the premieres and it, it certainly was not equal to Harry Potter in regards to like the impact on me, but it was a door that opened like an opened the door. It was the first fan fiction that I really like loved to read. Uh, I have a feeling some of my first explicit fan fiction came yeah because you this. read you read oh, 50 shades when it was masters of the universe right i did read i read 50 shades when it was yeah. masters of the universe uh i read a whole bunch of other fanfic like this is this was the door opening to my uh, like to adulthood for me and to romance in general and it is all because of this fucking book series. <laughs> uh, looking back at now, 
I'm like, man, trash, terrible. But I was in it and I was sold and I was the correct demographic. I was I was what the industry needed to encapsulate and what really made this successful. Yeah. Yeah. So. And it's it's so um it's so funny because like I don't think it, that Twilight's popularity now as an adult with, you know, more charity to my younger self and other young women, I can understand a lot better better why Twilight is popular despite the fact that the prose is terrible and that um and Bella as a main character yeah needs some work and the plot is like kind of like all over the place um and uh and inconsistent but I can I can kind of see it now and I think that um the kind of segueing into that we wanted to really talk about romance books in general because for Landon and I think for a lot of Twihards this was their first like actual romance if they had read any romance before it had been subplots in other books um but uh but this was truly the a plot the romance was the a plot and it's probably the first one that they read yeah so okay we're gonna put on my MFA hat we're going to put on my genre studies hat. We're going to talk. Let's talk about romance. So romance is one of, and traditionally has been in the last 20 years, the highest grossing genre uh, of, of every year. Romance is a, oversaturated, but also commonly the most purchased books books that happen. Mm -hmm. uh, bestsellers like can't even compare to romance because it is such a wanted market. Uh, traditionally speaking, statistically, women read more than men, especially as adults. And uh, romance is what they typically are gravitated towards and what is marketed to them because it is women writers uh, focused on, you know, that sort of rom-com feeling. So mm -hmm. really, really important to keep that in mind. But when Twilight was uh, around, we go back to the literary landscape of what why I look like or mm -hmm. and, and also like considering what romance requires typically in order to be considered a romance you need to have a uh book plot that is revolved around characters falling in love that ends in a happy ending and typically traditionally having some level of spice some level of tension and uh, sexual sexual tension, especially. Yeah, the will, or the will they won't. Be... The will they won't. They has to be there into some degree. Whether it's like, will they literally get together? Will yes. they do the deed? Will they actually work out? There has to be some yes. kind of like push and pull in that direction. But also, like a very very fair like real ass thing is that like it also needs to have it. <sighs> There's also different levels of romance. There's erotica, and then there's just traditional straight romance. Either way, you're getting a you're getting sex scenes. You're getting a little bit more adult relationships because they are things that are happening between adults, and that's what women want to typically read. Um, Stephanie Meyer did not. I, I this is my theory. I think Stephanie Meyer did not want to write a something that was hypersexual. Because mm -hmm. of being a Mormon woman, mm -hmm. she wasn't interested in that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the publishing industry was not going to pick up a story that did not have sex in it and did pretty not much. have interest in sex. Because yeah, adult romances pretty much always have sex in them mm -hmm. or you will get like through partway through the sex scene before there's like a fade to black, right? Yes. You don't just skip the sex, which is what... I agree. Like looking at interviews, reading the text of Twilight, I think she wanted a romance where she skipped the sex. Which understand, like I can understand why as a like a, as a woman who still is attracted to the tropes, is attracted to reading, would want something that falls in line with morals and what they're okay with. Could understand mm -hmm. that. Could could understand that there's probably even a niche market for that. Right. right? But as a large industry, which at this point, self-publishing was a lot harder. It was almost, it was vaguely unheard of. You didn't make any money off of it. Uh, she wasn't going to get published in 
a unless there was some more spice to it. The easiest thing to do to make sure that there wasn't spice is to age down the person to under 18. Because as soon as there's an underage girl, publishers can't take that and then publish it, right? Um, so it became this sort of midway in between thing where it had all of the trappings of a romance, uh, but was meant for an entirely different demographic. And that meant that they started looking at young adults and this new genre that was being born with the likes of Hunger Games and Harry Potter. We had just seen a huge success in Harry Potter. Uh, the later books had just started rolling out, which means that like romance was involved and there was interest within marketing and fandom. There was conversation revolving around it. Um, and so what ended up happening is they ended up putting out Twilight and YA readers have a lot in common with romance readers. They are typically mm -hmm. young women. They are typically interested in developing relationships. Uh, the genre itself was being defined, which means that there weren't any rules or anything like that. So as soon as that happened, as soon as young teenagers discovered romance novels without any sort of spice to it, the industry exploded and mm -hmm. it formed a new layer of what is now the young adult genre mm -hmm. and because of this success because of this influence of romance because of twilight it is nearly impossible to find a traditional young adult novel attended for teenagers without romance involved mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um they truly like the yes like obviously Dawson's Creek and many other One Tree Hill and but it many was like other TV. popular seat but like, those yeah. those were popular it hit that same demographic but mm -hmm. reading yeah like, romance, all of a sudden romance for teenagers was on TV because like having um romance without spice on TV was very common because you're not going to film those scenes you know and be able to air them so it was something where this was kind of exclusive to TV for that age demographic and now it's available in books and i truly like thinking about it and looking like kind of on the trajectory of everything that you're saying like i blame twilight for the reason that um there is no such thing as like YA or new adult fantasy anymore. It's all romanticy. All yeah. of it. All of it. Um, and and like we especially have the new adult genre, which is now now um like a newer. Uh, because YA has gotten so large and so popular that it's mm. had to be split into different categories. We now have traditional YA, which is for that 13 to 18 demographic. Your protagonist is going to be between the ages of 13 and, and 18. You have new adult, which is intended for adults between 18 and 30, uh, which means your protagonist is going to be anywhere in that age, but is written in the style with similar themes and tropes as young adult, but mm -hmm. written for an older audience. And then you have middle grades. Middle grades is typically written as uh, less complex, easier to read, lower reading levels for middle schoolers, but have those tropes of truly traditional YA prior to romance. Yeah. So where you're going to see YA books written in those styles with those tropes and themes is going to be for kids intended between the ages of 10 and 13. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and that, and then as soon as it hits 13, almost every single book that you will pick up has romance of some kind. Yep. Uh, <laughs> which is like not true to teeny. Like there are several, there are lots and lots of teenagers who do not find romance or are not interested in romance until their early 20s um, mm -hmm. or ever, if ever. So it and is, yeah. it is this... but the publishing market's always going to do what they think is going to sell. So and it does, sell. yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. But it is now the like written trope, the unwritten rule that there needs to be romance in your YA novels, yep. and that is because of Twilight, because of the success and the shape of the industry that Twilight made it have. Because now we know and understand that there is a market for romance novels that are meant for an underage audience true yep and uh i don't think anyone realized that that was a thing that they could do 
um, back before Twilight, or at least yep. like publish because publishers are risk averse. They're not going to do something that they think it might not work out. So yeah, no, yes, I mean when you think of when you think of publishing, <laughs> so like unfortunately the reality is is that publishing is mo- novels is so much more risky and there's actually a lot more money and jobs on the line than necessarily like a first season of a tv show Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. with at least tv shows you get revit you know you get like uh advert revenue um you're used to at least during this during this time uh when so like green lighting one season of of romance shows whether they worked or not happened all the time there's so many from that era where there's like one season romance cw type shows uh but for books you put so much money into it that unless the consumer really enjoys it you don't see a dime of that back yeah and so no one really wanted to take that risk or even thought i mean i can't even speak to like what marketing thought at that point but i could also see like people didn't think that this was what kids wanted YA was so new and mm-hmm. Harry Potter was so big that people were just trying to recreate Harry Potter. Yep. Yeah, pretty much. And then they tried to recreate Hunger Games. And so, yeah, for sure. Well, and Twilight um, blew up even before Hunger Games, which is why we right. see the pressure to there be a romance in Hunger Games. Mm-hmm, is be- mm-hmm. Even though it was written Even though it doesn't really exist. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and it was written and published within six months apart, which means that, yeah. like, truly Hunger Games was not influenced by the market that Twilight then created at all because the closeness of the publication dates and the writing. But it, it is interesting to see, mm-hmm. like, I'm not convinced Hunger Games would be published in a market like this today. Ma- yeah, maybe not. Because there isn't a heavy enough romance involved. Ma- yeah, maybe not. Um, Rar is saying, as a teenager, I was extremely frustrated by the prevalence of romance in literally every piece of media. Yeah, I, I know how you feel, yep. not because, like, it frustrates me for it to be there, but it's kind of, um, it's kind of interesting when you think about, like, gosh, when was the last time I read a popular book that did not have a large romance subplot that, uh, that was, like, maybe larger than it necessarily needed to be? Like, I'll give a, a good example. I'm reading through Fourth Wing right now. I finished the first book. I'm moving on to the second book. And, um, this, it's amazing, by the way. I didn't, I didn't know she had finished the no. first one. So that's great. It's so <laughs> that's good. good. That's good news. It's, it's so good, by the way. But, um, and I, and by the way, I love the romance in it. I would not want to cut anything, but, um, um, there are there are moments in the book where I'm almost I'm almost I'm like mm, I would like to hear a little bit more about how her classes are going. <laughs> yeah. like that happens because they have to make room for the romance. You know what I mean? Absol- um, absolutely. So yeah, that's that's like just something that happens nowadays. Uh, uh, you'll in get these that books. with Iron. Spoiler, but you'll get that with Iron Flame. You'll oh, hear good, because I'm, I'm starting it soon. I downloaded <laughs> it, so I'm going to start it soon. I'm excited. Um, um, but yeah, fourth one needed to, more shout dragons. Out to Audible. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, shout out to Audible. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So, but second yes. book needed more dragons. Oh, okay, okay. I haven't the gotten there yet. Second book needed more dragons. Oh, we'll talk about that later. Okay, okay yeah, yeah. Good to know. I haven't, I haven't read the second book yet, but I'll tell y'all when I read it. We can talk about it. Um. So, so yeah, that's that's kind of like the industry take on the romance. But there was a bit about romance that um that I also wanted to address. And this is something that we have touched on before because you guys know we have covered um, all of the Sailor Moon remake. And yes, we will be covering the last installment whenever they decide to release it where we can easily watch it subtitled. Okay, like what the heck? Why is that taking so long? Um, and, uh, and you know, the uh, that's really a romance first and foremost. Sailor Moon is really a romance first and foremost. And so we talked about it there. But this is my soapbox for this. Y'all, can we please stop bragging on the age gap? Okay, I just reread Twilight, and the age gap is really not the most problematic thing. It actually is totally fine. Um, it's weird that Edward goes to high school. Okay, I'm not going to deny that part. But the fact that he is an older vampire interested in a teenager, it actually totally makes sense with his backstory, and it's it's fine. Like, if you're bothered by it, I guess you haven't read a lot of vampire stories. You know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with the age gap here. It's as far as like if you take it as a fantasy that's with heightened emotion and uh, and heightened experiences. There's nothing wrong with it. We got to stop complaining about this stuff. I just, 
I actually just got into a debate with a, a person. About oh, this. do tell. Uh, it wasn't even a debate. It was just more of a like, hey, this is this is the perspective of uh, we really we've talked about this during anti conversations uh, that it is we really cannot hold our fictional standards to our moral I- ideologies in the world. Um, what happens in fiction does not happen to is not happening to real people. Mm-hmm. And does not, and while it, you can say that there is an interesting connection between this upset, this trope that is very popular within romances of a thousand hundred millennia old creature male and a teenage woman, you or teenage young 20s woman, you can say that there's a correlation and an interesting commentary on that, but that's all it is. It's an interesting commentary. It doesn't make it evil. It doesn't make it amoral. But the thing it is, it's like, Im- but it makes sense. Okay, but when you're ta- yeah. talking about a fantasy romance, it makes sense for a woman to be drawn to a story about an older man that actually likes her, that can take care of her, and she doesn't have to worry about the rest oh. of her life. That's a normal and fantasy to have. There's nothing wrong with it. And take care of himself. It. Yeah, and, and take care, care of himself. himself. Oh, oh my gosh, she doesn't have to raise him. Like, that's, that's what the fantasy that's what is. It is. And that's why these supernatural monsters are always these older men of some stripe, right? That's why they're like that. Because it's a man that she doesn't have to play mom to, and that's going to take care of her, and that's going to make sure that she has a calm, chill rest of her life. And like, who the heck doesn't want that? Who doesn't yes. want that? Who doesn't? Everybody wants that. <laughs> um so like yeah this concept of the age gap being weird and the the even like even so i know it is bad and it is creepy but even like the looking at her i'm like i'm sorry have you read any romance there is not a single healthy man in any romance book i have ever read no, dark they're all full or of red flags. healthy or they're full of red flags mm-hmm. the relationships are full of red flags because no one actually wants to read a story about a normal fucking relationship boring like, no boring so like let's stop <laughs> let's stop criticizing and stop like being like oh this is creepy and this is teaching girls bad things because the reality is is that it's not just twilight that's doing that it's not Everything. just and girls uh, know, okay, y'all, girls are not stupid. They know that in real life they don't want a man who sneaks into their house to watch them sleep, okay? They know that. Trying to pretend that that girls are actually that dumb and that if that happened to them in real life, they actually would be, like, legitimately smitten and not be like, whoa, wait a second, this is weird. Like, that's just not realistic. Also... I have a very, very tough time believing that someone read Twilight and then got in an abusive relationship because of Twilight. Yeah, there's other factors at play here that Twilight has nothing to do with. Now, there are certain, like, I can see people, like, arguing already about this. There are certain, there are certain like, books that that is different on. Uh, Fifty Shades of Grey being one of them. But that is more because it didn't show a true, it didn't show a true But even with access. that... I just think it's correlation, not causation. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, I well, don't think like, that the books are causing the problem. I think that our society causes the problem, right? And then well, the books also exist in that problematic society. Well, pe- no. I mean, people did go out and and get into unhealthy situations because they read Fifty yes. Shades of Grey. The problem is, however, that they only read Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah. That is the big problem. Well, like, okay, um, and, anybody, <laughs> and anybody that's, like, ever dabbled in the BD BDSM community. Yes, it's true. There are lots of men in the BDSM community that are there looking for women who don't really know how it works. And that's not Fifty Shades' fault that those men exist. Yes, exactly. Um, and then like also on that same on that same thing, I recognize that we will probably be having an interesting and slightly different conversation when we get to Renan's May. Uh-huh. In the fourth yes, book, yes, we will. Yes, uh, because I think but so too. <laughs> it is not going to be shaming the idea. It is just going to be that this was a bad piece of bread, and we will uh, like we haven't read it, or at least uh, yeah, you're not you're not We're there gonna yet. Get so there. we'll get there. Spoilers. But yeah, I think Fifty Shades is less getting into an abusive relationship and more. I'm going to try this new community with no idea of what's happening because this yes. book inspired me. Yeah, and unfortunately, there are bad actors within that community that people did get connected with. Um, and that that's you just, can't. But that's true. 
And that you also shouldn't jump into a community acting like an expert, putting yourself in situations that would be dangerous yeah. without fully researching stuff. Yeah, you and shouldn't that, do that with any you shouldn't do that with any kind of community that has a physical element. Like that's going to be true of like sports, of exercise communities, yes. um anything like that. That's that's going to be true. The, the minute we start treat, treating fiction as a how-to guide is the minute that people are going to be in danger. And it's not right. because of how fiction is written, it's how people are treating fiction like mm-hmm. a how-to guide. Mm-hmm. With an acronym like that, a question now something like that even exists. Well, you know, different strokes for different strokes, different strokes for different folks, Blue. Some people, some people like all that stuff, right? Yeah, people are freaks. People are freaks. It's true. <laughs> Most people do. Be. Yeah. All right. So, so that's, that's my little PSA of like, can we stop just, just can we stop talking about the age gap? And I'm going to make a promise to you guys. Um, when it comes to the age gap specifically, we're we're not going to talk about it again until we get to Renezme, okay? Because it's not interesting. It's not the interesting part of what makes Edward crazy. Like red flag. It's just it's not part of it, okay? No, yeah, no, not at all. All right. <clears throat> what is, what love? is love, baby? Don't baby, hurt don't me. Hurt me. <laughs> uh, Both this... genders, true blue, true. <laughs> this book is so successful Mm. not only because we talked about how it was genre breaking how it was genre defining uh but why why this book and the reality is is because this book what it makes what it lacks in spice and adult themes and that and those sorts of things it has to still fill the pages with us unresolved sexual tension uh like you you still have to fill fill those pages and what is filled with those pages is the perfect idea of what teenage love feels like right the all-consuming obsessive i am in love with this person the world stops today i will fuck over my entire future for this thing that is that like that this is perfectly encapsulated in this story right like that's what's that's what's so different about twilight compared to other ya books of the time and really compared to anything that is outside of um erotica or really steamy adult romances i would even say at the time is that when you read it like it really does describe exactly what it feels like to be in love for the first time. Yes. And that's part of why, like when I shared my experience, truly that's part of why I could not connect with it because I was getting older at that time and that's not what love felt like to me anymore. And so I struggled with with that idea of like, oh, you know, this this is uncomfortable to remember what this was like and how crazy this was. Um but that really is when you read the pages, it's like, oh, yeah, that is what it felt like the first time I had a serious boyfriend or that is what it felt like the first time I had a real crush on somebody. Right. And I fell head over heels. That is the first time that I actually, you know, felt like really parasocially interested in a celebrity. Right. It describes those emotions in one of the most raw ways that I have ever read. Um, it, I struggle to think of a book that does it better, to be honest. I, yeah, I, I can't. But I think what makes it so believable is their age. Mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. if you age them up to 26, 27, I'm all of a sudden getting the ick. Yeah. Because there is like, with 26 and 27 year olds, you're just like, bitch, you have rent to make. You have <laughs> you have a mortgage to pay for. You have a car payment. Like bills do be due. You can't just, your life cannot stop because this man has left for Alaska because he has feelings about sucking your blood. Like you can't, <laughs> you can't do that. Mm. Uh, but at 17... It absolutely feels real because yeah. because we I think it, like the universal teenage experience of understanding that when one thing goes wrong, when you're 17, your entire life stops. Like even if it feels like just for that moment, your entire life stops. And then when it's another person who does that. Oh, my God. But that is what it feels like when you're a teenager. When you're a teenager, everything feels like 10 times more than it really is. And you don't understand yet how to regulate those emotions, like truly. And Twilight just – Twilight is that from the first page to the last page. And it's not even just 
Edward, where it's like that. It also has to do with Bella's relationship with her parents, right? Like she acts like her mother is somebody to not like just because her mom has the new husband, boyfriend. I can't remember if they're married. Um, and, you know, uh, he's going to go. Ha- yeah, boy, fuck. he's going to go have a baseball career. And so, like, I don't want to stand in the way of that. I have to leave. And it's like, no, Bella, you really didn't even have to leave. That was really crazy that you thought you need to go live with your dad for that. Um, and then she goes and moves in with her dad and like. She's very negative on him too, like acts like he's pathetic just because he's not the best at cooking or taking care of the house. And she feels like she has to take that on. But like when you actually look at the text of what her parents do, not just her inner thoughts and how she reacts to them, but what they actually do, they're just doing their best to support their daughter. They're they're fine. They're good parents, well, actually, you know, I, it is very interesting, like because I think it's very clear that she didn't give any sort of personality to either parent. Yeah. Um, like she, she made truly two dimensional characters out of Bella's parents. She went, Charlie can't take care of himself. And Renee's and Renee's my, Renee is flighty. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because like the reality of the world starts like, coming to fruition and i'm just like wow you don't uh, stephanie meyer you don't really know how the world works do you um (laughs) yeah i think we're meant to to think of like oh bella is the same way that her mother was at that age with falling in love very young and very quickly but that's the only insight we really get into bella's mom's character is that that kind of like mirror foil effect that and she's willing like to (sighs) there's just so like i also realize i'm applying real life logic to things but i'm just like (laughs) wow minor league baseballers are my brother's age like so renee was hooking up with someone my brother like 25 to 30 possibly with a teenage daughter we we don't hear much about him no 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 and is willing to follow him around the country and like that's just i was just like this is the person who's been responsible for Bella well, her entire life. You know, life? Stephanie Meyer okay. for for all of her uh, her qualities. Uh, research is not one of them, as we that's know. True. She googled yeah. where does it rain most, and that's why this takes place in Forks. No, no, didn't look up anything about the town. Okay, doesn't actually know anything about it. Just googled where does it rain most. Okay, this book is set in Forks, right? So, do you think she googled anything about averages when it comes to minor league baseball players? Probably no. freaking not. Probably not. I I understand. It just is such a like. I'm just like wow. That's such a that's such a romance right there. Like that <laughs> that is the yeah. Renee the is a cougar, of a, of a, straight well, up cougar. <laughs> and then also just has that same sort of love. Just yeah. has that like all encompassing. I'll let my daughter go live in Forks, Washington, where she's miserable with the father who doesn't know her because I want to follow a man around the country. Mm -hmm. Like just, just has the same, it's the same flavor. It's just, that so happens that Edward is a vampire and Phil is a, a a minor, a minor league baseball player. Like, sorry, I just keep laughing because I'm like, no, but it's true, though. And kind of what think is- about it, like by the end of the books, I know we haven't gotten there yet, but by the end of the books, um, when Bella actually gets her powers and it turns out that she is the best, most mature, coolest vampire ever, you know, it kind of then she become the cougar. <laughs> kind of. Not really, Kinda. but she does. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. <laughs> So I mean, some very some but, foreshadowing. We're gonna give Stephanie Meyer all the credit here and say foreshadowing. Not really. That's not real. But we're gonna pretend. <laughs> but I I also think that there is something to be said too of like how this book is written. It truly does appear. It is like this cloudy, terrible time until she sees Edward. <gasps> and then and then oh. anytime Edward is on the screen, it screen it's like the clouds part mm-hmm. and it truly mm-hmm. is this sunshiny moment the only time that Bella seems to feel joy, which like as a teenager, I feel like can also be relatable. Mhm. Mm-hmm. Um and as a teenager, oops, sorry. You're not thinking of anything else. You're thinking no. of, I just want to do what makes me happy. And this makes me happy. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, he's a vampire. 
You're right, which is why it's totally believable that after being with him for only three months, Bella is ready to basically get married to him. Now, in the context of this, because she's 17, that means get turned into a vampire. But basically, that's what her her desire to, to have him turn her is, a desire to commit to him the way a man and wife would. Yes. And, and, that, and that she will forever be this and that they will forever be frozen in this moment right Uh, very teenage thinking very true um and and very believable like again i think that there is a reason why this was successful is because everybody who read it and who was paying the money for it was in this thought process was in this belief and i would say probably the adult fans of twilight because remember there was a lot of twi hard moms okay remember that was a whole thing they probably read this and thought like wow this is exactly how i felt when i was a teenager Mm -hmm. you know because now that i am a bit older and closer to the age of a lot of those twilight moms um like i'm probably the age now that the younger twilight moms were at the time um you know i can see that i can see reading this and being like this makes me feel nostalgic for my teenage years you know i can totally see that i think there's probably also a lot of connecting with like teenage daughters and things like that too because all of a sudden you're reading the same kinds of books without having to worry about what your child is reading because there isn't any sexual material right so it's like oh she can read a romance with me this is so exciting and and like that sort of connection too like I, i think that that truly uh, yeah, that makes sense. Like mm-hmm. it, 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 it was successful for that reason. It was, mm-hmm. and, and I think that that's the thing that we really want to focus on here. There is nothing about this book that makes it special. There, as far as plot goes, it's passable. As far as deep characters go, it's fine. As far as like what makes this successful is that it truly was lightning in a bottle. Mm -hmm. It was right time, right audience, right place. Mm -hmm. And that's why it exploded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, And I do think when it comes to the emotionality of Twilight, like, excuse me, that is if if we can say that Stephanie Meyer has any uh, a novel writing talent, like this is where it lies and being able to truly in the prose capture what that feels like. Um, Because she she does do that very, very well. And so credit where credit is due. Um, This book feels exactly like first love feels, period. Yeah. Yeah. So hats off to that. Good job for that. Yeah. All right. You guys ready to get into a spicy, spicy subject? Okay. (laughs) Enter Stage Window presents karen's hot takes we haven't had we haven't had one of these yet ready karen new segment new segment you guys okay this is it i am gonna say something that i believe is a unique idea that has never been posted to the internet it's so unique that landon and is gonna be like karen you're so dumb (laughs) but i am here to say it with my full chest okay so if i'm dumb then i'm just gonna be dumb okay anyways here's the take are y'all ready for it bella swan is not pants okay she's not pants you this is the this is the the take this is the take online that you see all the time oh twilight's popular because bella's pants you can read the book you can put on the bella pants and you can go have the little like romance adventure with the vampire but you know what Bella Swan might not be a good or well-written character, but she is a character, okay? She is. And the reason why she, well, actually, before I say the reason why, I want to say the qualities that Bella actually has that are demonstrated in the book, not just by her inner thoughts, but by the things that she does. The title, that's right, Blue, we're getting to the title. We're getting to the title, okay? Okay. What what does Bella do in the book? She is a motherly figure, okay? She takes care of the men in her life, and that is where she finds worth. How many times is she talking about making dinner for Charlie because he is so inept? Like, what the heck? I guess he doesn't eat. I guess he doesn't eat when Bella's not around, which makes no sense to me. What did he do he before Bella came he there? Have to eat. You know what? 
But <laughs> but what happens is Bella comes in and she sees this house and she is aghast. Okay, she is aghast and she says, "Charlie, you do not cook, you do not clean. What do you do?" And Bella says, "I'm going to do these things for you. I'm going to come in and I'm going to be mom of the house. Okay, that's my role here. All right. So that's one thing. One thing that's an actual character trait. Okay, she she like background noise moms Charlie to heck. Okay." Now, even though she is motherly, even though she is motherly, she is still She's so like, not. <laughs> you know what? Anyway, continue. Just kidding. Continue, continue. She continue. is. She is, though. She is in like the tactical things that a mom has to do. Okay. She takes care of the household. That is her job. Okay. But I so, don't think that that's motherly. She you know is what? responsible. We're going to continue with the take. We're going to continue with the take. All right. Sorry. I will shut up. I will shut up. Okay. And we're going to get to that in a second. But okay. So, but she's modern. All right. She is a modern. Um, she like especially in the the clothing that she wears in the um in the 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 things that she does right like she's not going to be somebody that is like obsessed with um with dressing a certain way right she's very um tomboy in that regard right and then the other trait that Bella actually has in the books, y'all, it's a short list. Um, it, it is. Okay, I'm going to admit it's a short list. But there is one other trait she has in the books. And that is whenever Edward saves her life at the end, and she's basically like, boy, why didn't you just turn me? Which, a valid question. Why didn't he just turn her? Okay, that's Alice's story. And he probably should have just turned her. Would have been way freaking easier and made a lot more sense. Okay, welcome back from the ads, by the way. I'm so sorry that the ads came during the hot take. Um, so she and Edward's like, no, I'm not doing that because reasons. I'm not going to explain those reasons, but because reasons. I'm, I'm just a traditional man, Bella, and you're just going to have to accept that. That's basically what happens. And, you know, some for some freaking reason, Bella just accepts this. She does not fight him. Boy, if that was me, it would have been a yelling match. OK, we would have been fighting. I would have been like, fuck you. We're mad. We're going to go to bed mad tonight. We'll talk about this in the morning. OK, you know what? So these are Bella's traits. They are few. But when you put them together, what I think actually happened is that Stephanie Meyer was like, how do I write the ideal teenage girl? And that's what she wrote. So I do not think Bella is pants. I do not think that you're supposed to project yourself onto Bella. You can if you want to. I personally don't. I don't find her really freak, very freaking relatable, as you can probably tell from the way I'm listing her traits. Not relatable to me. So I do not think that the purpose of Bella is to project onto her. I think the purpose of Bella is to be the ideal teenager in Stephanie Meyer's Mormon mind. All right. So that's the hot take. I think this is new content that's never existed on the internet before. What What do you guys think? Okay. Is this new? Have you heard this take before? I believe I'm the first. <laughs> Go I, <Landon>. love, <laughs> I, I love when I when, when this was first. I would just like to say, first of all, only half of Enter Stage Window agrees with this. Uh, <laughs> second of all, when I when when this subject was presented to me, uh, I went, Karen, what are Bella's character traits? And deadass, Karen looks at me for 30 seconds without saying anything because she couldn't think of what. You know what? That's not true because I had them written down. I said, hang on. And I scrolling through my notes. That's what actually happened. Oh, oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I think you just took your points and created character traits out no, of them. That's not uh, what happened. You know, Landon, stop not, doing no. the connect the dots meme to me right now. I'm connecting these dots. I am. <laughs> um, I've never heard anything about pants. Rar, I don't. I don't know. I feel like it was all over when Twilight was a thing. People were like, "Bella is a stupid character because you're you just self project on her. She doesn't have any qualities of her own." Yeah, that's what people were saying, and that's the why she's bad. That's not why she's bad. We're gonna get into why she's bad in just a second. But anyways, yeah, the concept of pants is like that you are able to put yourself into the character's shoes and be the character that you can mm -hmm. imagine yourself as the character. But I struggle uh, with this because I do not find Bella relatable at all. The choices that she makes are nothing even close to choices me or my friends would make. 
you know okay, but like the thing that yes i agree with you as far as like these are that i, I that i think i think stephanie meyer did think what is the perfect teenager yeah um that's what but i is. don't think that makes her less pants i disagree because i think as a i think as a teenage girl you were in in lots of households there is an expectation of taking care of others which is what you said motherly i believe is the word you said even though she's not warm to anyone that she's taking care no, of no she's not and warm she she's doing dim- she's doing the mechanics of it she's not she's doing, doing the emotional the man- work yeah. so she's yeah. doing the mechanics of being able to cook and clean yeah uh which i feel as women we are trained socially to do and especially around that times right so uh, ideal teenager helps in the sure, house but i also think a universal experience for a lot of women so relatable because it's universal modern i think was your second argument well because she does all these things in like a more modern way like she never does the whole like i want to get married thing and i want to just find a man like she only decides she's interested in men because she sees edward you know which is not you don't think that's relatable typical thing you don't think that's relatable to teenagers who feel like that they're different until until they feel like they're different until until that they want to be different that they that no one has ever experienced life like them and that they think that they are completely un uncomparable and that there is no experience at all like theirs you know what? Oh, this, until, this is why. until something happens that makes you realize that you think you're the main character of a novel, that's not a teenage experience? <laughs> Girl, okay, so this was my teenage experience. And maybe this is why, like, I just cannot relate. I came out the womb liking boys. And I wanted to kiss boys. And I wanted to hold boys' hands. Like, I had a little boyfriend when I was five years old. Okay? I did not understand, like, this idea of not but, seeing okay. boys and wanting every single freaking one of them. A completely unrelatable to me i have no <laughs> idea what that feels like but i do wonder karen did teenage you feel like you were like every other girl i just thought that um i was the same but like smarter okay so That's you did I not thought. feel like every other girl no no nobody you does everybody different. thinks they're unique a universal experience bella also thinks that she is unique yeah but she's not <laughs> She's, she's not. No, she's not. Like most teenagers, not unique. So, so far, two of your points have made her like every other teenage girl. So, a anyways, universal teenage experience. The whole point is like, I don't think that, mo- I don't think that this is a, that this is a thing that anyone can just read this and go put on the Bella pants and go have the fantasy. Like, I just don't think that that's how Twilight works. It wouldn't have such, people wouldn't have such hate boners for it if it did. Okay, so Bella Swan's not pants. She's just the ideal teenager from Stephanie Meyer's perspective, which is still bad and boring. Can I argue that I think Bella Swan is such a beige wall that you can paint yourself over it? I mean, I guess that's what people were doing, but I feel like you can do that with any character. I don't think that's unique to Bella. If you're interested in the world and the plot, then you're going to do that with any character. I I think that Bella makes it especially easy because there isn't much there. It's so, like, even when we're in her head, we're not even in her head. Like this is we bad have prose though. <laughs> bad prose and bad character development means that you can make your own shit up and put yourself into the world. Okay, so can we talk about the traits of Bella Swan that actually are problematic though? People go on about the pants thing, which I as you have heard, I do not think is is real. I do not agree with this. Okay, but there are things about Bella's character that are crap. And we're then I would like up. to address. Sorry. We're going to do just, by the way, we're going to do check-ins throughout the rest of the book series to just see if we're thinking she's pants yet or not. I think she's going to so, get less pants as the book I actually goes. think she gets, I think she gets less pants as the book I think she's going to get less. I think she's going to get um, more traits. I think she's pretty p- pantsy. Uh, maybe not. I think she gets we'll see, pants, but it'll we'll just see. Be we'll be like we'll be like the the Bella pants level. We'll do that. Like for each we'll book, we'll be like percentage percentage pants. <laughs> percentage pants. Right yeah. now she's sitting at an eighty. I'll give you twenty percent for your three for your three points of personality. <laughs> right now she's okay. at an eighty. Eighty. She's eighty percent <laughs> pants in the land. She's eighty percent pants. Okay. Oh no, in the land and pants scale, she is a beige wall. 
She's not <laughs> she's not even there in the room. She oh threw her god. out the window and put yourself in there. Oh my god. You're so uncharitable <laughs> to poor Bella. Baby, what did she ever do to you? <laughs> oh here, here's what she did I to you. I wasn't though. her. That's <laughs> what. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? You wouldn't want to be her. her. You know what? You wouldn't want to be her anyway because here's why she sucks. She actually hates oh her God. friends. Like legitimately, yeah. she gets invited into this well, friend circle and she's like, "Fuck all these losers. All I care about is Edward." Like what a bitch. She doesn't have any friends. Like No, she doesn't. Too. She has these she, people like, that think that they're friends with her only because she doesn't tell them the thoughts that she has about them, which is so teenager but like another I know, that's realistic. true that like, actually is like, real as teenager a, as a teach <laughs> as a teacher watching like when a new kid comes in uh is especially funny because it truly is like open season where it is just like oh new pe- fresh meat okay let's be friends maybe they'll be my friend <laughs> and it is very it is very funny i mean Un- unfortunately, I can say that this particular terrible trait of Bella, I can think of moments when I was Bella's age that I could relate. You know, teenagers are shitty people. I was too at 17. <laughs> I had friends that I did not like, I was... and I don't know why I continued to pretend that I did when I knew in my heart I didn't like them. I was perfect. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I came out of the, you came out of the womb, womb boy crazy. I came out of the womb perfect. Wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think this is just the difference between a straight girl and a non-straight girl. Honestly, yes. I think that's what's happening here. <laughs> Probably. This is the, the straight versus the gay childhood experience. <laughs> um, in addition to actually being really mean to her friends in her head, she says she misses Phoenix, but why? She hated everyone there too. She talks about how she had no friends in Phoenix and uh, and basically like she acts like Phoenix annoyed her. But then while she's in Fork, she spends a lot of time thinking about how she wants to go back to Phoenix where everyone hates her and she has no friends, even though here in Forks, she has a bunch of people trying really freaking hard to be her friend. Um, it's dumb. Why? She's so, why? I don't understand, Bella. Like, what? It, everywhere sucks to you. That's what I think. I think you just think that wherever you are sucks. It doesn't matter where it is. Phoenix is terrible. She's correct in hating Phoenix. Well, that's that's good that she's correct. At least, at least she's correct in her annoying contempt for her home city. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anything about Phoenix. I think, she, yeah, she just, she doesn't have any friends. She isn't likable, but yeah. people like her. Yeah. I like. I think that's the other thing about p- being yeah. her being pants is that like people like her even though she's done no reason to get them to like her. Well, that's why uh, she gets like the Mary Sue criticism, yes. which that's why I my hot take is not that she's not a Mary Sue because she is in a lot of ways. I'm not going to argue she that is. she's not. Um, and this is one of the ways that she kind of is. Like everyone likes her even though she doesn't like anyone back. That doesn't make any sense. That's not how the real world works. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I. Yeah. <sighs> She just, and then also, like, she doesn't grow as a character. That's true. She's the same That's on page one as she too. is on page whatever, 300. She continues, she continues to be stagnant. Yeah. Yeah. She does stagnate. And, and, and will for a few more books. I, yeah, I think, honestly, if based on my vague, vague memories, it's not until book four that she gets some more personality I think traits she, and growth. I think I think that there is some growth in book three, but certainly not. We'll in book find two. out. We'll find we'll out. Because my we'll memories, find my out. memories of Twilight were so vague that I really, I, I, and I started realizing as I was reading it how much I didn't remember. And I think I'm going to have the same experience with the other books too. Yes, I think so. So yeah. All right. Third terrible thing. Wait, wait, wait. There's oh. one more. Third terrible thing. Um, she has no personal hobbies or interests. Uh, she's oh, only yeah. good at school because she covered all those topics in Phoenix. So school is not her hobby. She she didn't have any Again. boyfriends before Edward. So boys are not her hobby. She doesn't have any like artistic skills, no musical instruments. She hates sports and is objectively bad at them as well as dancing. She does nothing That's with her That's part time. of why I think she's pants. Because you could just like, I think she's such an easy, and why by pants, I think she's such an easy fan fiction character because you could just like put her in there and then okay, make so her like something. Can I, can I ask you this? Do fan fictions give her hobbies and interests? Is that a thing that the fanfic world for Twilight does? No, because fan fiction doesn't give anyone hobbies. That's what I thought. Other than that's what I thought. Dick. Girl, that's what I thought. 
<laughs> I I think that I think that Bella is just she's so that she's benign. She doesn't exist outside of Edward, even prior to meeting Edward. Her life is revolves around him prior to meeting him. I want to read she's the Bella waiting. Swan prequel and see what Why? that's like. You can it's because the first I would like to hurt pages. myself. I just I would enjoy that. I think um, the pain of that. <laughs> It's not even like someone as someone who enjoys writing and reading pain. That's not even wouldn't be painful. It'd just be boring. <laughs> Nothing happens. <sighs> oh, my mom is in love with a baseball player. I guess I have to leave. Terrible. Because God forbid, God forbid she goes to an away game and leaves me alone for yeah, three nights in a row. That, that plot point, I tried. I tried to figure out like a fanfic I, way to reconcile I think, that. It I doesn't think make she any sense. must have I think she just must have been here, tired of hearing the sex. Yeah. Must have been I think she must have the just sex been was like too loud God, and annoying. I we share a wall. It's so <laughs> loud. <laughs> they won't stop. It's every I have night to move in with my dad. Every night. <laughs> I have to move in with my dad who doesn't have a girlfriend. Maybe to just get away with it for a Maybe. Yeah. Or maybe, maybe the that uh, you know, if if he's there, like Bella doesn't get to cook or clean ever because her mom's in like girlfriend oh, that's mode. True. Maybe, maybe she misses she... the cooking and cleaning, so she goes to Charlie so she can cook and clean. But her her <laughs> mother is so fucking flighty, you know that I she's know, not cooking right? and cleaning. Well, that's what I imagine. Like I imagine Bella's doing all the cooking and cleaning at her mom's house too. She's taking care of her mom because her mom that's is what a I child. Figure. Yeah, that's what All I right. assume. That's what I assume. Anyways, let's move on from this. Okay, we're done with the hot take. Stay tuned to next time for a new hot take. <laughs> Baseball player is doing the cooking and cleaning. Oh my god! Yeah. All right, you. Guys. I mean, okay. The minor league is a five is like a five thousand dollar a year job, and you're <laughs> part time, so probably. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh yes okay you guys um as you know interstage window is sponsored by audible and you can get the audible version of all the twilight books that's what i am reading i thought the 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 narration like the actual reader for the audible twilight book was pretty good i i liked the the tone of voice it was like it was interesting got me through the boring parts okay that uh that really that i really suffered when i when i read this as a as a younger person um that I, and actually read it you know so so yeah i actually do think like as far as reading twilight i do recommend the audible version yeah but landon also has an audible recommendation for us that she would like to share. Ooh. So I love that we're back in the in the fantasy fantasy realm. Not that it ever stopped me from making fantasy wrecks in the first place, but now I'm just like, hey, if you liked Twilight and you like the black, white, and red aesthetic of a cover from Blood and Ash, uh, is amazing. It's a uh, new adult fantasy romance. Uh about a young woman who is referred to as the maiden. Uh, she has a, she she holds a very um, important part of the religious aspect of this one kingdom. And, uh, you know, invaders may come and kidnap her. And she discovers that the world that she is from may not be as good as it seems. And of course, mm. there's a very handsome guard and perhaps a handsome prince uh, who... Uh, you know, maybe it just catches her eye. And it's a lot of fun. It's a good, it's a good full series. There are some, there's an interesting element to the war. And then uh, there's a whole, there's a whole like pantheon that's very interesting and the religious, the religion elements that are pretty cool. Uh, it's not the best written world, but it's a lot of fun, especially if you have been reading along with my recommendations, such as Akatar and Iron Flame uh, from Blood and Ashes a, is a very good uh secondary place to go look when you are done with those very nice yeah so if you would like to support the show audibletrial.com slash interstage window to get your free 30-day trial and oh excuse me um there's a lot of bubbles in the, the LaCroix if you if you want to support the show you can go there get a 30-day trial uh we I like audible so like I would recommend keeping it but like I understand if you don't want to you can totally cancel it so long as you just sign up for the the 30 day free trial. Um, it still helps the show, even if you do not keep audible. So don't feel pressured to do that. Also, you get to keep the books that your credits buy. So even yep. if you are no longer subscribed, you still own those books, which means you can have an entire library. Exactly. 
That's true, because those books stay yours so long as Audible exists, whether you have a subscription or not. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. And it's provided by Amazon, so it's not going anywhere. That's right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Bezos. Bezos. <laughs> All right, shall we move on? Yes. Okay. All right. So we this have is another, another segment. little. Yeah. So, so for the rest of this, we've got kind of another segment we wanted to do, talking about what's up with the Cullens. Oh my God! Us in our thirties realizing that the twenty-three-year-old doctor and his twenty-six-year-old wife have five adopted antisocial teenagers who happen to all be in romantic relationships with each other. Wow. Yes, that is what happens in Twilight. I I think, okay, so here's the deal. We haven't read New Moon yet, but there is a scene in New Moon where, like, Edward's, like, he's Carlisle, who is 23. Uh, It was turned to 23, so looks like a 23-year-old. Starting to look 30, and people are questioning it. And that's, like, the excuse for leaving. Mm -hmm. And working at a school has me wondering why the fuck CPS hasn't gotten involved. Good question. Why the fuck didn't a guidance counselor go... Hmm. This seems suspicious. <laughs> Anna and Kendrick worrisome. is all of us in this face I, right here. <laughs> the the mania of that face, the mm-hmm. oh fucking god. Uh <laughs> of like going from true joy to what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. Uh, that I feel this face is that. Because I'm so, just like, wow. So there's a reason that the actors that portray Esme and Carlisle in the movie do not look the ages that they are supposed to be on the page. They look like they're in their 30s. And that is because that makes visually way more sense. If they actually looked like they were in their 20s, um, then uh, yeah, this would be very strange visually. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it would be very strange. Also, the concept of, like, a 23-year-old doctor, like, a, like someone who looks 23, being yeah. like, I'm a full-ass doctor, uh, he wouldn't have even graduated middle school school at that point, my dude. Yeah, he wouldn't have. Like, how did you do all of that? What, do you have a time turner? Like, yeah, apparently. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any, maybe she aged gracefully. I mean, maybe. If some, I mean, some people sometimes don't look their ages. That is very true. That is very true. But there is no reason that uh, that they have to be these ages on the page when it doesn't make sense for the things that they've done. Literally, the only reason for the weird ages, like narratively, is to explain why they move every so often. Yes. Uh, yeah. And then it just like, it gets a little weirder when you're like realizing that like Edward and... Edward and Carlisle are like five years apart mm-hmm. and he's playing yeah. dad yeah this is kind like, of funny it just there's a weird there's a weird sort of like I there's so much like here's here's a better fucking backstory you ready for this they're not mm-hmm. adopted Carlisle's chill like Carlisle's brother and sister are Emmett Edward and Alice and their parents died mysteriously, and now all of a sudden he's stuck with them. And the halls belong to Esme, as far as like their ch- like their siblings. And then Carlisle and Esme got married, and no one pretends to be in a relationship. <laughs> but the thing is, is the the, the whole reason, hours. <laughs> but see, but Landon, that wouldn't match like the gigantic nuclear family that is the ideal, oh, right. which is that's why right, the Cullens right, right, are like right, how they right. are. They have to be right, right, right. an ideal gigantic nuclear family. You're right. I'm so sorry. I forgot Mormonism was part yes, of this. Yes. I mean, well, how could you forget this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, instead... Let's just talk about Carlisle and Esme. Okay, so the other thing about the the Cullens that's so funny is they all have a unique power. So in this world, when you become a vampire, you get some kind of power. Now, explicit amazing powers are rare, but all vampires have like it's some kind of minorish power usually. Um, yeah, it's kind of a, a, you're not supposed to yeah. like that isn't stated explicitly but i truly here is what i truly but they actually do, think though. happened I, they do because, because I think even when they meet the they, other vampires it's like oh that one's a hunter this is how his power works well but i know? think stephanie meyer like literally when blocking this out went oh let me what is the main character trait 
of each yeah. character. That's their power. And then just highlighted it. Yeah. It didn't make it a power, just didn't know how to write the character. Yeah. And so like really, really focused on that one aspect of them. And for those who didn't have actual powers, that comes across almost power wise because she has nothing else to talk about. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Where in my because... sire contract did it say I can levitate stuff again? I mean, that would be awesome. But it's not like that type of power. So let let us let us explain. So for Carlisle and Esme, Esme's power is she is mom. She She's has mom. mom power. <laughs> She knows That's how to make it. you feel better. She knows mm-hmm. how to take care of you. Mm-hmm. She's empathetic. She's she got that special kind. chicken soup. She's demure. Mm-hmm. She is going to be willing to k- cook you dinner, even though she none of them eat. Yeah, like she is truly mom. She you does all the like laundry. In the, in the Sims, if you have a family sim, they can learn that like um, soup. A recipe that helps you get better faster. It's like grandma's soup or whatever. That is that is Esme's power. She can just yes. do that. Those effects. That's um, power. And though she literally can't, like, she, there's no superpower behind it. That is just the vibe that you get. Mm-hmm. Um, and Carlisle is wise and old. Yeah. And it's self-control, just, right? The thing they keep talking yeah. about with him is how amazing it is that he can be a doctor and work around blood and, like, just be chill about it. Yep. But he has no desire to drink uh, human human blood. It is it is very this idea of being like, oh, I'm a sinful creature, but I am choosing not to be a sinner. Uh, in, mm-hmm, some, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in some different metaphor, Carlisle would have been the gay guy who chose mm-hmm, not to be gay. Mm-hmm. Like, it truly is that sort yes. of vibe. Yeah, and he's, like, Um, teaching all of his children how to be good little straight vampires. Yes. Yeah. Um, And that it just is his own morality. That makes him so worthy of this. Look at this beautiful 26 and 23-year-old. Right? Can't you tell that that's how old they are? (laughs) Yeah. So we said we're not going to rag on the age gap, but, like, this is silly. Like, these age, the vampire age age thing is silly. It's it's the it's the it's the it's the lack of an age gap uh-huh. that is silly. <laughs> uh-huh. Truly. I I think <laughs> Carlisle looks weird and scary to me. Me too, Rar. Okay. Y'all remember like how in the Daddy books... Carlisle. Anyways, let me just cuz I agree. Okay. So in the books, like Carlisle is described as like basically making all of the nurses cream their pants every time he walks into the hospital, right? And then you see him in the movies and instead of looking like objectively like what a woman thinks is hot, he looks plastic. This is the type of hot Carlisle is. Have you ever seen the movie AI and it's got... um, Jude Law with the the character Gigolo Joe and he's like he's like a a Gigolo android and he looks plastic. Okay, that's what Carlisle looks like here. Dude, it's Ken. It's Ken. Oh, my God. He looks he does look like a weird Ken. He looks like an android. Yes, he looks like a Ken bot. Okay, he looks like a Ken bot. It's like so weird. Anyways, that's what I think about Carlisle's looks in the movie. He looks like a Ken robot. Yes. Thank you, chat. Ken droid. That's right. (laughs) Landon, tell us why he's your type. He's just daddy. <laughs> no, I love a good. I love. See, oh, this is fan fiction rubbing off on me. Mm-hmm. Um, I love a good. I love a good story of a uh, a man who <laughs> of a. How do I say this without being a creeper? Just say it. Uh, say it. A religious. A religious man who feel he has found God tempted by uh, the sins around him, and that's just the vibe that Carlisle gives off. Landon, do you uh, just do you just like a sinful blonde boy with daddy issues? Yeah. 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 Maybe. Yeah. Uh, I also love him and Esme's. <laughs> I also love his and Emma, Esme's love story. I actually genuinely. Well, that's true. Think I do actually is, think it is cute. the most. Yeah. It is the cutest and. Uh, it's so sad that we don't truly get, like, we get a whole, like, fucking what feels like a flashback for all of them, except mm-hmm. for these two. We get, like, like a we couple get, lines. We get a couple of lines here and there, but I, like, really want to know, like, but, like, it just, Esme, I mean, okay. Well, for Landon, regale you, us. Don't why don't you regale us yes. with your so, version of, Esme, of their love story? Esme met Carlisle when she was a little girl because he, like, 
fixed her arm Mm -hmm. uh, when she was like in her early teenagers, which I I know some people are going to forget about. Um, But then, uh, you know, working and being a doctor and she had like a schoolgirl crush on him and he moved away and she got married and the man she married was a very bad man um and ended up beating her and nearly killing her and did kill their son uh and carlisle and she ended up i think she ended up jumping off a cliff right yeah uh, and carlisle uh, who kind of was obsessed with her in return and had seen her again and had been like the doctor to take care of her after she had gotten beaten um kind of had that same obsession with her that edward had with with bella and uh and refused to let her go refused to let her die and Mm -hmm. changed her uh as she fell off the hill and it was the it was a moment of selfishness like he describes it as a moment of selfishness for him because with with edward he looked at it and went you have so much longer to live and that was the one reason i cursed you with this life uh and with esme it was all about the fact that he couldn't see himself living without her yeah it's very sweet. I I it's like very it. sweet. I uh, I think it's that's nice. the romance story I want. God, <clears throat> please write this story. Mm-hmm. I want I want Leah being a lesbian, which is something we'll get. We're going to talk later. about that next book. And, next I, book, next and book. I want Esme and Carlisle's story. No more gender swaps. No more his or her points of view. This is what I fucking want, Stephanie. Yeah, Esme. I think Esme would be so compelling as a romance um, female main character. Truly, I really think she would, because um, I think she hits a lot of the the notes that um, Stephanie Meyer makes makes Bella appealing to Stephanie Meyer while being way more interesting and varied. Yes. Well, in a fully developed co- like character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like, I want to know how she got into that abusive relationship. Like, what happened to her? I want to hear all the dramatics about how she thought it wasn't worth going on anymore without her son and yada. Like, I want to hear all that. That sounds very interesting to me. I also want to hear, like, her reaction to being a vampire, of struggling with, like, because also, like, that's the other thing, too, as they admit to struggling with it. Mm -hmm. Of, like, not only struggling with the concept of, like, she wanted to die and then all of a sudden she is nearly impossible to kill uh but also the fact that like she now has to drink human blood Mm -hmm. and she now has to like become the monsters that she was afraid of and and and, like struggling with that concept of it Mm -hmm. like it's a really compelling story and i have read lots of fan fiction about it (laughs) yes so carlisle and esme that's their deal um who's next Emmett, Emmett and, Rosalie. and Rosalie. Oh my god. So, so <laughs> we don't actually get as much Emmett and Rosalie in the books, truly. Um, but basically their powers are Emmett's power is being super strong, okay? And yeah. Rosalie's power is being absolutely drop dead, beautiful, gorgeous. She's the HBIC. Uh and they're very aloof in this book. Yes. Um and they make Emmett much more of a puppy dog. Uh, in the movies and he will be a puppy dog further on but uh, they are both very alert aloof and what we really know is that they Rosalie is Rosalie and Emmett are both the strongest ones against Edward dating Bella and yeah. even talking to Bella uh, because it fucks up their life and they and don't that's want honestly why we don't hear from them very much that's why yeah. we don't get very much of them in this book but yeah I agree with you Rara I think Emmett's very interesting and I wish um, we had more of him I know we get more later so yeah and I do love this as a trope. Like yeah. it is, it is the high school quarterback and, yeah, and, Ro- and Rosalie. It yeah. is, it is the like uh, ice queen and the golden retriever puppy dog. Like it, it is a trope that I truly love, and I do love this idea that Rosalie was like so overcome and so fascinatingly in love with Emmett upon just seeing him that she begged Carlisle to turn him Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that that's like a very sweet relatable relatable love story (laughs) that's like that's like the first love at first sight unbelievable shit that I want to read in my romances not whatever this was yeah (laughs) like and then and then it happened for her like she didn't have to like hear no a zillion times you know she got turned so I like and then we have Alice and Jasper Oh, so uh, this is like the fan favorite couple, right? Yes. Other than Edward and Bella. Like, this is what the fandom loves. So Alice's, um, Alice and Jasper have actual, like, power powers, right? So Alice can see the future, um, sort of, kind of. 
And then Jasper actually has a way to influence other people's emotions um, telepathically. So he can literally just make you feel better or make you feel like crap just by being around you and projecting that onto you. Yes. He, he's described as having like a very therapist sort of feel, yeah. uh, not because he talks or anything, uh, but because he literally just like calms people down uh, and makes them yeah. less emotional. Now, Alice does all the talking for this relationship. Jasper is yes. almost a nothing character. Um, we will learn more about them. We get more insight into both of their characters in the upcoming books. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's some interesting choices were made. <laughs> We'll get there. Uh, we'll get there. Just some very interesting choices. Uh, so that's that's what's up with this. Alice is obviously totally on board for Edward and Bella. She sees Bella being a vampire one day. She is absolutely in love with this. She loves Bella like a sister. She's all for it. And uh, Jasper is hesitant mostly because he is, as uh, they I, they state in the next one, he's the newest. He he is while he is actually as old or not as old, but older than Edward and anybody else in the family other than Carlisle. Uh, he is the newest to drinking animal blood mm-hmm. rather than mm-hmm. human blood. Yeah. So uh, he, he, he had a period in his life where he he was like doing his own thing, drinking human blood, basically. Is the, what the, major, the majority of his life was. Yeah. I think it was like the 60s that he stopped. Yeah. Um, and now he's a they... vegetarian vampire with the rest of them. Yes. So, all right. Lastly, and then we have Edward. So, Edward. Uh, gonna... uh, sorry, yeah. I, I just want to say Edward does have an explicit power as well, reading minds. Okay, so that's that's Edward's party trick. And we're not going to talk about him too much because uh, a we have several other books, but most importantly, we have Midnight Sun, which mm-hmm. is this book from Edward's point of view. And Wait. I feel that that is the that is the episode in which we are going to really dive into Edward. But from what we know here and now, uh, Edward is the second of the Cullens. He has been drinking human blood for most of his life except for a small stint in there in which he wasn't uh and he has never really had a partner even though uh carlisle has tried to make it happen Mm -hmm. uh rosalie was originally picked up quote unquote for edward uh and that obviously did not work out but it is this concept of um edward has been alone for a very long time in a and he then found his perfect temptation Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. So. so, uh, so poor Edward ha- is not only, uh, you know, a vegetarian vampire when he, he knows he could drink human blood. So he's had that experience. So he knows what that's like. He also has, um, repeated high school, uh, almost the most amount of times of any of the, the kids mm-hmm. and has not found a wife like the rest of them had. So he is the, the saddest of the sad vampire boys. He's so, bored yes and he's constantly reading his siblings minds which Mm -hmm. has to be hell i mean Uh, it has to be Mm -hmm. all right so we are to the end of our show so we have the big question now yes okay go ahead ask me landa sounds like you're about to did it resonate karen no no (laughs) It didn't resonate when it came out for me. It still doesn't resonate now. The thing that's changed is I can understand how it resonated with its target audience, but I was never a part of that target audience just by virtue of always being the wrong age, you know? So like, I just, I just didn't hit it and I don't find um, any of the characters really that relatable there's certain things about both alice and rosalie that i can kind of relate to but for the most part these characters like are just they're just not my thing and especially bella and edward are not my thing um i do find edward the most interesting character but that's because he he is (laughs) objectively he is he is Um, the most interesting character but but no, like this just, you know, it's it's not my it's not my cup of tea. And I don't think that it ever will be, to be honest. So what about you, Landon? Does the first no. Twilight book resonate? No. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. Oh. There's not a single likable character 
other than Alice, and that's mostly because I've projected likable ability onto her. <laughs> there is no plot that is reasonable. It is all my least favorite tropes of a romance without any of the spice. And as someone who has read a lot of romance in the last 365 days, there is... I I get why Younger Me liked it. And I appreciate Younger Me for discovering this and being a part of this franchise because I would not have been the avid reader I am today without this series. Uh, but it is at the bottom of my red list this year. Yeah. Um, if you guys, I can't get the thing to work. But anyway, if you scroll down to the about, you'll see a link to the Discord. Hop in our Discord server if you want to see Landon's last year of reading report, and you will see what she means. Yes. She she reads a fuck ton of romance, like so much. A um, lot. <laughs> so 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 Landon, since you were a Twilight fan and now rereading the book, it really does not resonate with you anymore. Do you no. regret the reread? You are, you've cursed us for the next six months too, or the next year, but the next six books. Uh, we are reading it whether I regret the reread or not. Um, <laughs> this is a book I never needed to return to, but it is a book that is necessary to talk about if we're going to talk about all the other books within this era. Like, this was my idea. Like, I, I'm sitting there and saying that Karen has cursed us with this. I came up with reading Twilight. I came, I pushed it, like, originally. I was like, this is, seems like the next series that we have to do. Um, because it it was genre defining. Mm -hmm. I truly believe Harry Potter, Hunger Games, and Twilight made up the genre of what young adult is. And yeah. then because of that formed what new adult is now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Like, I don't think that young adult or new adult novels now would be anything like they are if it were not for these three series. So we had it, to. If we were yeah. going to do Harry Potter, Harry Potter, and Hunger Games, we had to do Twilight. You're right. It had such a huge impact. Um, and then I think that those impacts rippled. I mean, I think that we have a lot of, I, I think that a lot of the book series we have uh, now are because of it. But also think of the movies that came out of it. The yeah. movie industry boomed because of this book, of this movie and this book series. And then the, the sequential movies that were produced made on top of this one. Uh, and now we're seeing miniseries and TV mm -hmm. shows based off of books that I truly do not think would have been picked up or successful if Twilight had not been a success. Yeah. So for that reason, I absolutely don't regret the reread because it belongs on the pedestal and it belongs on us talking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it, it's not my story anymore. It's mm. not for me anymore. Oh, Landon's um, grown up, you guys. Oh, I'm grown oh. up. But I also don't, like, I also think it's not for, like, I think that this is truly an example of a book that has run its course. Yeah. Like, I would never suggest this series to uh, someone else to read because I think it's also out of date. Like, yeah, I think there's, it's there's also unreadable. Other romances that you would recommend nowadays to to a teenager trying to get into romance, right? Yes. Yeah. Or or any sort of, like, series, like, wanting vamp. Like, there are more vampire books that I would suggest. Yeah. I, I think, like, that's the other thing, too, of, like, I, I think that this is, I, I think Hunger Games has stayed the test of time as far as its readability with the generations that is happening now. And I even think Harry Potter has stood the test of time of its readability. Twilight yeah. hasn't. Twilight is, it, it is not a classic. Whereas the other two, if you looked at YA classics, it would be. Yeah. Um, like, I think there's, changed... there's still things for teenagers to get out of those books. Yeah. It mm -hmm. changed the game, but it didn't, it didn't become, it didn't make itself a classic. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. I would agree with that for sure. Yep. Okay. So, so the answer is no for the first one. Stay tuned to see if any of that changes for the next books. <laughs> It won't. <laughs> All right. Where can you find us? All right. You can find us right here on Twitch. And if you liked today's stream, you should definitely drop a follow. We are getting very close to our next 100 followers here on Twitch. And when we do, I will plan another 12 hour stream with the theme of Sims and Slime. Okay. So we'll go back to some OG topics. Uh, oh, my God. We hit 500. Yes, that's the plan. So follow. Um, also, we, we simultaneously stream to YouTube. If that's an easier viewing experience you're of course welcome to go subscribe and watch there all of the vods i post them all to youtube so you can do that if you ever miss one um but i don't watch the youtube chat so like if you're chatting to me on youtube i might see it i might not um 
Our next Inner Stage Window episode will be in February, and it will be the Mean Girls movie musical. I'm so I have excited. Seen, I've seen the Broadway musical, so um, yes. we're going to go watch oh, yes. the movie, and uh, we're going to see what we think, okay? But La- Landon, yeah. you never, you didn't see the Broadway musical, right? Or have you seen it? Uh, I've no, I've pirated it. I have not yeah, seen, that's what I, mean. I have not seen a, uh, an, a live showing of it. However, I have downloaded and ha- have always loved since it came out. I have loved the, uh, the soundtrack, right? The soundtrack. Great. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Uh, and then I am also, cause I'm a gay woman and I have to be, I'm a Renee Rapps stan. I'm well. so excited <laughs> to see her as uh, Regina George. Uh, we're going on Monday. Very excited about it. Okay. I got to get my tickets. I'm going to go soon. Um, so yeah, I'm excited for that. Uh, also, the main game that we're playing here on the channel right now is Final Fantasy X-2. We are on our third playthrough. We're doing the Fiend Tales. I'm going for a 200% run. So um, we're going to basically be showing off everything. So it takes multiple runs of this game to do that. So that's the main game that you'll see here. Also, for 2024, we have a new Community Day game. It is Sunhaven. My face is covering it up right now. Hang on. Let me Let me show you guys this. Oh, that's the wrong thing. I didn't grab my camera. This is my camera. To see, there we go. Sunhaven playing with viewers. So the first one of that is not this coming Saturday. It's the next Saturday. And it should be the usual suspects. Me, Landon, Kitty, and Kendra um, are the main people. But if you are interested and you want to get in on the first one, then you want to hop in the Discord and get the farmer roll, okay? Because our first episode is going to be in two weeks. So if you want to be part of the crew that um, that's in that and you want to get in there from the beginning, that's what you want to do. So that's what's going on with the channel and uh, and what we're doing here. So yeah, um, follow me on all the things. Here's all my socials. And Landon, where can everybody find you? Uh, you can find me at Land in Maine on Instagram or TikTok. Uh, you can also buy my book on Amazon. I have two of them, Around the World and Back Again and The Lessons I've Paid For. Uh, if you are interested in my poetry, I also post poetry videos on uh, TikTok. Mm-hmm. All right, you guys, so I'm going to swap back to just looking at our faces because it is time to go ahead and uh, say goodbye to Landon. Uh, I will be switching over to the game. I'll be taking a stretch break. And uh, so, yeah, bye, Landon. It was so great to talk about Twilight. Um, I'm so excited for the next book. The next book will be in March if you guys want to read along with us. But you guys that are watching, don't go anywhere because I will be back with some more Final Fantasy X-2 of our Fiend Tales run. I'm just going to take a quick stretch break. So um, we're going to go ahead and stop the recording also. So for y'all watching the, the recording on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe down below. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All right. Bye, YouTube. Bye.